Welcome to Cabo-Ville News and Community Update in English. This is Corey Riggs along with Claudia Velo, and we have a very special interview with Dr. Jeff Moses from Smiles International Foundation, who's been doing a lot of good work in Los Cabos. And, and Claudia, I'm going to let you take it away here because you have been talking with, with Dr. Moses. I know a little bit about, about uh, Dr. Moses, but I know a lot about Smiles International and the work that they have been doing here in Los Cabos for years. So before anything else, Dr. Moses, thank you. And thank you to your team, because I know that you have been coming to Los Cabos for years now, and you have helped literally, I think, uh, hundreds, if not, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, of children and have improved their quality of life. So first of all, thank you. And then secondly, Welcome. We are just truly honored to have you here. Can you please tell us how long have you been coming to Cabo and how come Cabo? How did you end up here? <laughs> well, that's uh, interesting. I've been coming to Cabo since I was a teenager. Um, but in terms of the mission, the mission is now in its 11th year. Uh, and uh, we have uh, really been blessed with the way in which we started. Uh, I'm a Rotarian. Uh, the project has some roots linked through Rotary because uh, I had just finished a project in the Ukraine and was uh, relaxing a little bit over the holidays down in Costa Rica with my wife, where we live part time. And I got a call from a Rotarian friend who was doing a makeup over at the uh, resort at the Solmar. And uh, he said, I'm sitting here next to uh, some doctors that. Um, say that they have a cleft um, population here that's currently being untreated. And we, I told them you would help. <laughs> I didn't know that all the promises made um, through my friends would uh, come to fruition so quickly, but it did. Literally, um, by April that year, we were already funded and set up to come right into Cabo and get our project started. So uh, as I was mentioning uh, before to Corey, it's, uh, um, I try not to be involved with pushing doors open and God opens them and I get sucked through. And this is a very good example of that. Uh, that, that I, I love, I love that. I love that visual. God opens them and I get sucked through and just, we're so, we're so thankful. First of all, that God sucked you through to Los Cabos and, and all the children you've, you've been able to help. And where are you originally from? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where, where are you originally from? And, well, um, I was Japanese until 11. I was born um, in Japan illegally. Um, and it's a little bit of a story. Um, my father was a fighter pilot, both in South Africa or North Africa and in Southern Italy. During World War II, he came back and then was brought back into the service in the Korean conflict and was in the occupied Japanese uh, city of Tokyo. Uh, my mother, um, well, had me in the oven at that point in time. So I was already conceived. I just hadn't popped out yet. And my two older sisters were with her up in Champaign in Urbana, Illinois. And somehow a photograph drifted across her view from sent from some friends of hers somewhere. And he had a geisha girl in the picture somewhere nearby. And so she thought it would be wise if she hopped a freighter over to Japan, knocked on the door and told him, hey, Buster, you move over and you're coming into the uh, population because she couldn't be on base. It was during the war. The State Department didn't allow families. And so I was illegally born there and was a Japanese citizen until 11, had to be naturalized and became a U.S. citizen at that time. Uh, so I pretty much uh, moved around as a military um, family would and um, ended up, ended up uh, really my experience in Mexico uh, started very early, uh, you know, living in San Diego for a while and then finally uh, settling out. I went through training. Uh, I learned to fly and I began to fly doing dental missions after I went through a dental school. We came down to Karahe in the Baja and I saw the cleft population in these children's villages, said I need to do something. I really I made a bond with God. I said, you put me through the training, I'll do this. And that's kind of how we ended up with that. Wow. Wow. What a, what a, what a, what a great story. And I'm so intrigued by your past as well. Do you speak Japanese? 
I did it until they beat it out of me. And when we moved back to uh, Arlington, Virginia, uh, my two um, well, pseudo mothers, uh, as an Air Force officer's wife, my mother had a couple of uh, nannies that raised me, uh, Yoshiko and Doriko. Um, dearly loved, but they only had six month visas. So after six months, they left. And of course, being a young boy, I was traumatized and acted out at school. And so I say they beat it out of me, but I was just <laughs> acting out. <laughs> so yeah, well, you, I kind of lost it. <laughs> well, it's, in, it's intriguing. And we're going to get into what you're doing in Los Cabos, but just want to ask you a couple other questions about your past. And you also mentioned that you live in Costa Rica. Whereabouts in Costa Rica do you live part time? Yeah, we live in a tennis. Actually, it's in a little village called uh, Rio Grande. Uh, the river uh, is nearby. There's a Rio Grande River. And uh, a tennis means Athens in Spanish, of course. And it's a beautiful area of Costa Rica on the hillsides right before you go into the central valley of San Jose. Temperatures are 76 degrees year round. It's just wonderful. And uh, I had met my wife on one of the missions years before, and then uh, we began to uh, postulate that because one of my project missions is at the Children's Hospital in San Jose, Costa Rica, that it would be good if we built a little place to store our supplies. And that grew into a home, and that grew into something that we live at um, December through March, and, uh, wow. and then again sometimes in August. So. Well, it's, it's incredible. I, and I was asking because I, I spent a lot of time in Nosara and the Guanacaste Peninsula sure, and, sure. and about six months there. So off and on. And I done a lot yeah, of yoga, yoga visit. there. Yeah. <laughs> I will. I will. It's a, it's a big yoga play, yoga and surf place. So it's, a, Absolutely. it's my passion. So it's a great, it's a, Costa Rica is a great place. So tell us about, you just currently finished treatments for children. Tell us a little bit about how long it was and and how many children you were able to, to help this time. Sure, sure. Our projects go from Saturday to Saturday, and uh, it's uh, we, we're modifying them, of course, based on what's happened in this last year with the COVID uh, health crisis. And we've had to modify what we used to do, and that was open the doors to everyone anywhere to show up. We'd have you know, hundreds of, of people gathered in a room screening hundreds of children. And then we would do as many as we could based on a triage. Um, my military background in a, a naval service uh, taught me how to triage and the, using the, the idea that the most important um, procedures that are most time sensitive for the benefit of the growth and development would be the ones treated first. Of course, in military, the triage was a little differently oriented, uh, but nonetheless, the concept's the same because you cannot treat them all. And so now with the way COVID has come about, we are treating children that will most definitely go through their stages from birth until adulthood. And remember that um, people fail to realize that a cleft lip and palate, a complete cleft, may need five to seven surgeries throughout the growth and development years. And it needs to be applied to the child at the proper time so that they can benefit most uh, in their growth and development. Our object is to do these for these children all the way through until we can turn out a child to be uh, the most um, effective member of the community and be able to contribute by being able to breathe well, eat well, speak well, hear well, and then obviously smile and interact to be able to uh, enter society and be productive. Um, so that's what's happened uh, in terms of not being able to take, unfortunately, everybody else's cases that they've been working on and then finishing them for them or et cetera. We've in fact had to uh, take our children and, and triage the ones that will be with us all the way through because mm -hmm. as they go, our clinics will have to expand and we can have only so much volunteer resources. Mm -hmm. Our volunteer surgeons, these are uh, many world-renowned professors in cranial maxillofacial surgery. I myself am a cranial maxillofacial surgeon retired, but I used to teach some of these very same people who then became professors who are teaching more, and they are the experts. They're already board certified. They're already at the top of their field, and we bring them into this because our foundation believes in providing the best care for these children that uh, anywhere can be achieved. And then we bring in pediatric anesthesiologists so that they're extremely safely 
uh, treated under anesthesia while we do these procedures. And we'll do multiple procedures while they're asleep so that we can take advantage of the fact that we put all this time and effort and money into putting them asleep. We might as well do two or three of the mm. procedures and try to get that done early. So we extend that surgical time and, and, and as such, we have to limit the total number of cases perhaps there, but we get the most benefit out of all the resources. Uh, we have expert nurses, pediatric um, intensive care nurses for recovery, volunteers are just um, uh, really wonderful. And the support we get in Cabo, I have to say, is some of the best that I, I have. Of course, we link through my roots in Rotary and the Rotary Club of Los Cabos has been a big resource for us and um, helping us with transportation to and from the airport with many of our uh, volunteers flying in from uh, sometimes different countries, sometimes all over the United States. And so that's been a huge help. And then providing lunches during the week so that we can focus on what we're doing and not have to break and leave the hospital and go out to try to catch nutrition. So that's been great. And then the Solmar Foundation adopted us. It's been wonderful. Um, the, uh, the Nora has gone through and she has uh, provided rooms for the many uh, parts of our team. Our team has surgeons, um, uh, speech pathology. We have, we have a, a variety of people that come in to do this. During the COVID times, we've had to trim the team a little bit. So I'm going to say that this particular time, we basically were focusing on surgery. Okay. But in general, if you take a look at our model, our model, one of our teams is up in Ensenada, Mexico. It's been going on now for 40 years. Uh, I had the pleasure of operating a baby and then handing her away in marriage over the course of seven <laughs> surgeries uh, because her father had passed it. I was asked to be the patron. So wow, <laughs> and, you know, wow. these are these are the things that make uh, the team members want to come back time after time because we do follow the children from birth through maturity. And that's rare in, in many practices in the United States. They're, they're limited by insurance. And if they change the insurance, they can't see them anymore. If they, yeah. let's say they, uh, their family moves, they can't see them anymore, things like that. So this provides longitudinal care that is, um, I would say it's one of the drawing factors, but it's also one of the best benefits uh, for our volunteers. They pay their own way down. They pay, take off their own vacation um, other than you know, getting some of the uh, lunches provided or perhaps a hotel night, uh, they, they pick up the tab for that. So, and then uh, we do try to sweeten the pot a little bit because I have uh, with the foundation, we registered it with the Department of Human and Health Resources Education, and we yep. can provide continuing education for them. And that since they have to go anyway to maintain their license, these yeah. doctors and nurses can use this and we'll provide lectures from other, all these experts or professors anyway, why not give a course? And so in the evening, sometimes we'll have little conferences that will take care of that and they can gather their CMEs, their continuing mm -hmm. education yeah. that satisfies their need on that. And they don't have to buy a course somewhere. And um, it's a win-win all the way around. And our, our volunteers are, are tremendously blessed by these. We really wouldn't be able to do it, however, without the local coordination of, uh, we focused on a communications director, Letitia Gottwald of the Gottwald University. She is managing both here and Tecate. We have another project, mm -hmm. Smalls of Tecate. So we're taking care of both ends of the Cabo and, or of the Baja. And, uh, and then we have also Dr. Macrina, Dr. Macrina Bustos of MaxiMed who helps us be, by taking out sutures or following the children afterwards. She's a maxillofacial surgeon. So mm -hmm. all in all, everybody's volunteering. Everybody pitches in. It's a team approach. It's not, it's by no means a uh, one trick pony. Well, if you're just joining us, you're listening to Dr. Jeff Moses, and we're talking about Smiles International Foundation. Obviously you can listen to us on 96.3 FM Cabo Meal, or you can follow us on Facebook Live at Cabo Meal News. So doctor, I wanted to show a couple of images here. So if you're watching us on Facebook, you can see there's a, there's an image. Can you just talk to us a little bit about this image of this child? And Yes, this is Claudia. Uh, she showed up. I actually, she presented back in February. We're here in February of this year. We opened 
uh, back up from COVID. Um, we had to take a little bit of time off because of the uh, focus of COVID over the period of time. And um, this a patient had arrived and was very severely clefted, very wide, as you can see, both in the palate and lip, and it goes up into the nose and had a little difficulty with eating, as you can imagine, uh, because the food would come right back out the top. And there's a very, very small premaxilla, fancy word for the area of the upper jaw where the front teeth would grow down. You could imagine that's kind of gone. And uh, the blessings are this little child has such a wonderful family. They treated her like nothing was wrong. And this child would dance around. We have videos, videos of her clapping her hands and dancing for all the team and just, smile, you know, and she captured the heart, uh, definitely, this trip. And this is uh, the result of the first stage of her reconstruction and um, the beginning of a change in the life. Absolutely life-changing. Go ahead, Claudia. Um, how long will it take for her to have full use of everything? Like, like The five to seven surgeries that these children will need and I'll kind of summarize them because obviously there may be some revisions in there. If, if, uh, healing is individual, and uh, but uh, assuming everything moves right along, the child usually at about age 17 is finished. So it does, at age, uh, at, you know, at the beginning we close the lip and the muscle of the lip, okay? And that helps mold the upper jaw. You can see her here, kind of dancing around, smiling at everybody. And then we go in and we, we begin to close the palate so that they can um, have a seal and be able to create suction and, and feed better. The back of their throat then gets brought up so that they don't talk hypernasally. You hear children that have not had this done, not on very much like that. It's very difficult to enter society and and. Uh, interact, and that's very important for job um, security to be able to communicate, not just the looks, it's the communication. You can get past looks in an instant and see the heart of a person, but if they can't communicate, it's very difficult. Uh, and because the back of the uh, palate is not sealed, there's a muscle back there, and it helps pull the eustachian tubes. And if that's not working, we always create that as much as we can, then the ears get infected, and they have a... Um, a need for having tubes placed. And uh, we have a, a volunteer that lives here. Uh, uh, a, a Dr. Hecht is a, a very wonderful ENT surgeon. We have other uh, surgeons that uh, have helped us in the past uh, uh, that live here, and uh, Otorino that lives here, and help us with the tubes at the time. And, and that helps drain the ears so that they don't go deaf. And so there's another surgery. And, and there's a, uh, another one as the upper jaw doesn't develop very well, the lower jaw continues. So they end up with this lantern jaw, if you want to look at it. You know, the, the real strong lower jaw that sticks out in the upper jaw's back. And so we then have to go in and do a reconstructive bone surgery to move that forward, have the teeth come together so they can actually chew. And then of course their nose is affected by the cleft and we have to straighten the cartilages of the nose and uh, the, the septum so they can breathe well. So there's a, like I say, a multitude of all of that going on. And usually uh, the end of this is in the late teens and then they can move ahead with everything else. So it's step by step. And uh, in some of our clinics, like I mentioned, the one in Ensenada, we even have orthodontists. Uh, we have uh, genetic counseling because it is primarily a genetically induced problem. Okay, it is, like I said, there's epidemiology of where they, where it's frequent more than there are others. And um, we can say that there's three major areas of the world that you can categorize. The Americas from Argentina all the way up to Alaska. And we're gonna count Alaska as part of Asia because we remember the ice bridge that comes across. So, so the Americas are one in 650 births, kind of masa menos, all right? So um, it could be 600, it could be 700, but it's one in 650. Let's just sort it to that, depending on where you are in that strip of continent <laughs> and strip. Then in uh, Africa and in Scandinavia, of those, you know, ironically, those two areas, it's only one in 1100. So it's half as frequent. You know, and then in Asia, which includes, um, like I said, of uh, the 
Eskimo Indians and the up in the Arctic and then across the ice bridge into China and India and the Philippines and all of that down in through there. Uh, that's uh, one in 350, so twice as frequent. And so there's epidemiology there. Then that, then that's all idiopathic and somewhat location direct. But there's also the ones that are, um, let's just say, uh, environmentally driven. And it could be a, a, a person that perhaps is a drug user or had uh, alcohol um, abuse and you get fetal alcohol syndromes that are clefted. And perhaps the nutrition was down in some areas, but they lived wonderfully, it's, uh, but they, they didn't have folic acid in their diet and they had bad nutrition or dehydration. There are some that are caused that way, but by, by far the mo majority is genetic. That's why we have genetic counseling that would tell a person that has a cleft um, that your, your chances of having another one could be one in four. And if that child has a cleft, then that child's children have one in four chance of having a, a clefted thing. So you'll see families where I've operated, you know, grandmother, mother, and daughter, <laughs> and uh, it, you know, and, and the one in uh, in Sonata with 40 years experience in that one location. Uh, the other is, of course, consanguinity, and that's unusual. But let me give you an example because we're in Mexico and I'm kind of a surgical anthropologist and Mexico is very interesting. Uh, the Pichi tribe from uh, from up in the um, Andes, uh, uh, actually in Peru, coming all the way up in Mesoamerica into the Yucatan back in the age of the Maya, and that's 400 BC to 400 AD, the golden years of Maya, believe that the clefted patient was a sign of the gods because they had a jaguar god. And if you look back in the, uh, uh, the, the glyphs that are on the, uh, you know, at, at uh, Bekal and, and Tikal and uh, Ishpuhil and, and Chetumal, they, they worship the jaguar. And because it was the king of the jungle, and what does the jaguar have on its upper lip? A cat lip, right? It's got a split. Mm. And so they thought that was the, you know, the peach, you know, that was it. And the, the shaman would go down into their cenotes at night and convert and transform into jaguars and roam as, as God, you know, kings and gods of the, of the jungle. So you'll see this in the archeological museum in, in Mexico City and some of these other areas, these adzes where they would sacrifice and cut the heart out, et cetera. On the face of the ads, you'll see a bilateral cleft lip. It's a baby with a bilateral cleft lip. You know, I have photographs and a whole presentation on this. Very interesting, the archeological aspect. Now, how does that tie into consanguinity? Well. The, uh, like all civilizations, the Maya had their, how do we call it, Congress in the United States. The Congress, how's that? You know? <laughs> Can't get rid of them, they're up there. They, they had their legislative taxes. branch. <laughs> you know, they want the taxes. They, they stand up there and they put all the clefted honor people behind them, the little princes and princesses, the gods behind them, make them in a little village they, they put behind and they would stand out and say, more corn, more corn, bring the mice, you know, that the gods are hungry. And of course, you know, I think it's the congressmen that are hungry. Anyway, but bottom line is back in there, they would interbreed with the clefted because they it was an honor. Now, of course, some of them would pass because it was such a severe feeding problem, but some of them would live and they would continue this. So in those 800 years, it created such a genetic strength within the base of the Yucatan that we have a project called Mayan Smiles. And we go to Ishpuhil, which means tail of a cat, all right, so the jaguar cat. And it's right in the area of uh, Bacon ruins and Chetumal and that sort of thing. It's really wonderful, but there's so many to do that its numbers match or exceed the Asian numbers, okay? And so some of those people, the, the, the gene pool has blended into the population, of course. And so some of them move across in different parts of the country. And you might even see them right up here in Cabo San Lucas with a family in the hills here coming and working at the resorts. And that's how it happens. That's where it goes. And you might see pockets where it's stronger in one area or another. And that's where we go. Wow, wow. Yes. Well, well, Doctor, yeah, I, I see the hospital, the especial, especialidades behind you. Yes. And yeah, is that, that picture. 
Is that where you're doing these procedures or? Yes, one of when I first um, heard about it, the Rotarian uh, that was president at the time at that club uh, was one of the owners of the Hospital Especiedades, and that's uh, Dr. Avalos, uh, uh, Alejandro Avalos. He's been a constant volunteer source, giving up a entire week of his operating rooms for our projects twice a year for many, many years, for all 11 years we've been coming here. He also opens um, the door for any extra things that need to be done when a patient needs some extra attention or the medications we run uh, low and he'll need to run out and get them. Um, uh, we put in a new generator there for backup electricity because that hospital uh, provides care for urgency care when we're gone. And so we uh, have a symbiotic relationship that can help both parties um, uh, in, in terms of making sure that that's available to us all the way through. And when a hurricane comes, things like that, and the power goes out, uh, you can rest assured this hospital is up and running still. So it's a, it's a really wonderful thing. He's a Rotarian, but that's, you know, that's not the major reason he does this because he is who he is and that hospital is what it is. Uh, that's a great thing. We're, we're, we have just about 30 seconds left on this side of the break. We'll take a break and we'll, we'll have you, we have so much more to talk about. We're gonna continue on the other side of the break. And just wanted to show, this is the website that you have. So people can, can go and take a look. And the website is smilesinternationalfoundation.org. So you can go check it out. And we're gonna talk about when we come back, doctor, we wanna talk about how people get involved, whether it's financially involved or also, it sounded like you don't have an orthodontist here. You have one up north. We, we, need, we should find that for you. And whatever, whatever else you need, I think we can, we can talk about that when we come back. But stay with us. We're just gonna take a quick break. Be right back. Awesome. All right. All right, uh, we can just come back, right, Claudia? Yeah. Okay, give me just give me one second. I'm gonna put the timer here. Three. Welcome back to Capital News and Community Update in English with Corey Riggs and Claudia Velo. Today we are speaking with Dr. Jeff Moses of Smiles International Foundation and just getting into a lot of great conversation. You can listen to us, obviously, on 96.3 FM Cabo Mill. We suggest that you go to Cabo Mill News on Facebook, or you can check us out on YouTube at Cabo Mill News as well, and you'll see some great pictures that we have shown of some of the patients that, that the doctor has helped, and just an incredible story. And, and the history lesson you were giving us, too, of before about Mexico and Southern Mexico, and wow, what an incredible thing. Claudia, I'm going to let oh, you take over. <laughs> yeah. Claudia, I'm going to let you take over for a while. I, you know, you know me. I can't stop myself. No, no, it's it's fascinating. I have a question about the families because you mentioned um, in the case of, of your little patient, Claudia, my namesake. Um, she she was welcomed and treated by her family as any other child, lovingly. And, and obviously caring for her, that's, that's how she ended up with you. Um, how do you go about training, I imagine, the parents and the, the entire family regarding care and follow-up after uh, the children go through, through the, these interventions? I'm really glad you brought that up. I have to tell you that um, during the course of my training and then providing this care, I felt there was some sort of missing link and it came during one of my project missions in Costa Rica with uh, crossing paths with my current wife uh, in the airport. And uh, she uh, specializes and works with um, the education of patients and how to forgive, for instance, these cleft children when they get to school, uh, they're tormented because of the difference in the face um, and how they speak, et cetera. And she has special training in hospital um, hypnosis, uh, clinical hypnosis, and also uh, Reiki healing and also energy healing. And she works with the families of the, of the patients that we treat. As surgeons, we are nothing more than a glorified mechanic that puts things close and God heals them. Okay. 
but the heart is something different because you know there's a special need for interactions with the families and the siblings and then their outside friends and um, Maribel takes that in control and works with these families that way. Uh, I can tell you that in in these uh, families, you might find that there are superstitions also. Uh, some of the families that come from a remote area might think that the mother was at fault because perhaps she or uh, they had their uh, conception on the sign of the moon or the husband was cheating and therefore it was a sign of God punishing the family or this or that. All that's nonsense, as I talked about before, but she helps to unravel that and get back to the roots of the, the true ideology and then how to treat it and then how to uh, accept it and then how to forgive those children that are maybe tormenting by showing these children with the lessons as they grow that all children may have something that is awry but their face may look normally but maybe their father's an alcoholic or maybe there's a trauma in the home or whatever so she really gets into that and then also treats the families at the same time she's been with me now uh, through these missions for many years several decades and so she understands the stages and she's able to communicate that she's transferred that knowledge to Leticia Gottwald our communications director and Leticia continues that work with uh, her projects with coaching happiness and other things and has been able to continue that coaching because you're right um, they need to know. Well, the doctors can work on them. They can give post-op instructions, but that's pretty much one day. Dr. McCrina can see them post-op and look at their sutures, make sure they're healing well, but that's pretty much one day. So it does take a number of visits, which is why we continue to come to the same location every six months until it's complete. There are some areas like our clinic in Ensenada that come four times a year. And as we grow, of course, we have to add more clinics. And this is a really young clinic here. I mean, you think 11 years, oh, that's a long, not, not at all. Not when you think that we are committed for the lifetime. And, and these are, when we adopt a, a site, we don't do it lightly because it's a strong commitment throughout the life of those, of those children and the family. And our people are committed to that site. I don't bring all my surgeons to every site, they adopt a site. And then the next group will be in Ishpuhil, the next group will be in Takati, the next group will be in Ukraine. So uh, I may be the only one that has all the sites, but I'm, I'm getting old, I gotta transfer this to somebody, you know? <laughs> and I'm grooming them, trust me, I'm grooming them. But uh, uh, that's that's the blessing. My, my wife's the one that really has brought that uh, to fruition and filled that, my unsettled uh, gap in the project because that was needed. And thank you for asking that question. Was now, it, it, go ahead, Clem, sorry. Sorry, um, I understand and, and you've been talking about how such a huge part of this is done through volunteering your surgeons, your team. How can people get involved? How can they support your missions? And, and how do they go about it? Well, excellent. Um, well, first know that it's here and know that it's permanent. Um, and then when you, in your interactions with people, you hear about somebody that might have had a baby that way and they're scared, they don't know what to do. Well, have them contact just so that um, that can, that can we can lay many things to rest and ease them, even if we're, they need not put them into our program. Maybe they don't qualify. Maybe they've had something done somewhere else and they're part of somebody else's program, but we can help. And we can line them up with resources, not just not just what we're doing here. Uh, secondarily, um, those that want to contribute, it's easy. The website has a contribution donate page. Yes, PayPal takes a chunk out of it, but it makes it easy. Okay, so you know it could be any way of contribu uh, contributing, and that's great. Um, also, volunteering. We have a volunteer button, and you click, and it talks about where the sites are, and if you'd like to contribute some of something that you can do. Um, and uh, we've had everything from families that want to come make sandwiches for the children, and some of our sites that don't have a rotary helping with the food and things like that, to uh, providing transportation for the children to go to and from the clinic, or perhaps uh, giving an overnight stay 
for some of the kids um, or helping with a hotel room. So all those things are feasible um, depending and, and it's flexible. What we call it a sliding scale wall of terrorism. <laughs> That's, that's very good. Well, Doctor, a couple of things you brought up, which I just find it, it really touched my, my heart. When we first opened this conversation, you said God opens the door and you get sucked through. And then the, the next thing you said is surgeons just put things close and God heals it. And I thought both of those statements, first of all, I'm reading, I'm reading Victor Frankl right now, Man's Search for Meaning. And so you also mentioned World War II, <laughs> the end of World oh, War yeah. II when you were born and so it all just came together. How important is, is your faith in this work? And, and, and obviously to make a lifetime commitment to places, I, I think it's, it's, first of all, it's so powerful. So thank you for, for what you're doing. And just how important is, is your faith in, in this? Well, uh, the first thing I have to say is that uh, the foundation is not a religious organization. Um, and when we use the word mission, uh, it's often confused with proselytizing. It is not. It's a mission because I used to be assigned to Green Corps as a naval officer. <laughs> so instead of having a, uh, a weapon in a holster, it was a scalpel. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think faith has a, a, large, uh, a large role in my personal application of the foundation. Mm. Uh, but I, again, uh, I believe that, and, and a lot of different faiths are involved in this. Uh, we have every every nationality, every religion involved in our foundation mm. uh, at leadership levels and, and functional levels. So there's no distinction, it all washes. Um, but I can say that uh, to a T, people are affected by giving in this way. And the benefits that they get give them a, a deep-seated satisfaction. They sometimes question when you go into an area that has abject poverty and tremendous disease, they question, uh, how can that be? How's that fair? And I have to go back and say, where would we be getting our, our, our blessings of being able to give if that wasn't there? So mm -hmm. there is a grand purpose. And as you're reading, Frank, oh, you'll discover more. <laughs> That's what I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just yeah. right in that part where he says the people that survived were the ones that looked at it like a challenge in their life. And, and they're it's, the ones that, blessing, yeah. yeah, it's a blessing that this was a yeah, blessing it, to it wake really up. And, and, and I just, uh, I would, I would put out there and challenge your listeners to, uh, uh, to look for a way to be other directed. Uh, rather than inner or self-directed. And they'll live longer, they'll be happier, and there'll be a tremendous benefit. And it's a win-win both ways. So you, uh, I believe that we're in our in our mission field or our project field. I have to start calling them projects instead of missions, I guess. <laughs> but in oh, our no. project field, Don't change, we're, it. Yeah, Don't change it. Mission is good. Mission is good. <laughs> um, we are the ones being selfish because the benefits that we go home with, the full hearts are just there totally outweigh the small amount that you might contribute by flying in or doing this or giving up your week vacation or whatever. It totally outweighed by that benefit. And I, 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 I challenge people to go that way um, and, and all of it. There's, a, there's the uh, looking at both sides of a coin in a positive way or negative. And this is a way to be selfish in a positive way. Well, and, and, and if, if you're listening today, go out and get a copy of Victor Frankel's A Man's Search for Meaning because, wow. It's, it's, it's not long either. It's not long. So it's, it's, it's interesting that we can, we can get into that, but, but well, so many, so many profound things. What, what you, you mentioned before that you have, you have an orthodontist in the North Baja. Is it, that's something that you need here in, in Los Cabos or is that maybe we can help well, you find somebody. Well, we've reset the uh, clock on this mission, this project, this site, all right? And COVID reset the clock for us. It was actually a, a blessing in disguise. It was starting to get out of hand. Uh, we were having hundreds of children at different stages, and it was not going through the logical progression to turn out the perfect results that we pride ourselves on. You know, we were some picking up cases that it had something done somewhere else, maybe it didn't go well, this or that, we're trying to salvage. And so you know, we've reset the clock and now we're, the whole mission is reset. We're now moving our way forward. 
after we go through the lip, the palate, the throat for speech, the, the nose, the bone graft to fill it up, and then the tooth comes in. Around that time, seven years of age is a good time, seven to 11, where we involve an orthodontist. So we have time to meet and groom and enthuse some people in the dental profession to, to fill that role. It's not easy, trust me, because we're, we're happy to set up grants or I can do a fundraiser for brackets, you know, to put on the braces and stuff like that. But there's a lot, as you know, with orthodontics. I don't know if you have children in orthodontics, but there's a lot going on there. And they're, not everyone is exactly trained in surgical orthodontics because it's a different style of animal. Um, as you heard of in orthodontics, a retainer, a retainer is meant to retain it in the position that they finished long enough for the whole world to settle in and the bones to align and everything be solid. So where if you lose your retainer, you don't all collapse back into crooked teeth, right? I, I, I think I lost about 20 of them growing up. So I had, yeah, I had braces yeah, exactly. for years because and I lost my retainers. a lot of ah. retainers. Yeah, you didn't want to wear them anyway. <laughs> yeah. But the retainer concept allows you to visualize what's happening. The teeth are trying to go back to where they were, correct? Now, when you move a jaw, let's say the lower jaw back and the upper jaw forward, they want to relapse the way they were. They want to go back forward and back backwards. So mm -hmm. that's one area of relapse. Not everything is totally stable when you move it because the tissues want to pull it back to where it was. You're stretching the upper face or the lip or the nose. And so when braces are put on, if the guy with the, or gal with the, the orthodontic expertise tries to move the teeth forward on the upper and the teeth back on the lower, they're going to want to relapse in that same direction. But that's the direction the surgery is going. So it, it is counterintuitive um, for the orthodontist to move them in the wrong direction. And that's what we need for surgery. So we have to work with these orthodontists very closely. They can't do what they were taught in school. And so there's a little bit of finesse in there, um, Corey, that, that requires us to be intimately involved in that. So we have time. We have a couple of years here where these kids are moving up towards that and we plan on making use of it. But if anybody listening out there has the wherewithal and has a wonderful orthodox practice and would like to expand in this area, we're here for um, you know, helping you get more education in that area. And we, and we definitely invest in that. Well, Claudia and I both know a lot of people in the foundation world here. I actually run a foundation and, and would be happy to get information about your next mission coming here and, and see if there's some way we can we can help. But there's also Amigos de los Niños who does dental clinics here. I know yeah. that, that Gay we Thatcher. Yes. Oh, we great. Actually, great. We actually uh, donated several uh, well, there was another mission, and uh, it was in the Baja, Amigos de Niños de Baja, and they folded and they gave us the foundations, dump things on other people. <laughs> Since they knew we were here, we got all their uh, portable dental uh, operatories and folding chairs and all that sort of stuff, the sterilizers. And since um, uh, I don't want to pay for storage, <laughs> I donated it to them and they made use of it. And so uh, that's a, it's a wonderful place. We visited there numerous times, Kay and the rest of them. And, and we have a, a couple of colleagues of mine that we communicate. One's a dentist lives down in um, uh, Puerto, Puerto Los Angeles and, uh, and married uh, into a Mexican family. And, one of the children that they had had a cleft and he flew him up here and we got that fixed. So it's a very wow. uh, intimate relationship we have with them. And they do, they actually do some of the volunteer dentistry for your group there. So yes, the answer is yes. Uh, we're always integrating. And if you look at the very first page for our website, it has all the hands together. Mm. It's a partnership for sure. We can't do it alone. Oh, well, that's, that's <laughs> wonderful. Claudia, anything, we have about four minutes left. Claudia, any, anything else you want to ask, ask Doctor? I'm in awe. You know when, when you know when I'm in awe, I just get quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Well, no, thank you very much for having me on. I'm, I, if I can answer more questions, uh, 
I, well, my, my wife's better at uh, responding in Spanish than I am. Mine is pretty, uh, I learned it from my suegra uh, <laughs> and she spoke no English and we're, and we're still learning. So uh, is your, is your wife Costa Rican or is yes, 100% Costa Rican. A tica, uh, a tica. Tica. Yes. Es yeah, un, yeah, es yeah. Un tica, yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 I always tell her that I speak so fluently when she's not around to correct me. I don't understand. <laughs> Pura vida, pura vida. <laughs> well, it's great, Doctor. It's it's just great having you on. Thank you for all that you're doing for Los Cabos and for other places in the world. It's just wonderful to to have you. I I I can I know I can speak for myself. I know many of our listeners and Claudia. I can probably speak for you as saying we learned a lot today. I, I learned a lot about a lot of different things. And, Best and the kid. jaguar, I love that. Yes, the, the we we have the the lecture is called "Smile of the Jaguar." <laughs> wow! Oh, By the way, I, I do yeah. want to mention this. I want to uh, mention the uh, uh, the contact uh, for the projects, and we are doing the contact directly through our communications director, our board of directors at the Smiles International Foundation Central. Um. And I had some influence over because I am president and founder. So I leaned on everybody. <laughs> but I said, look, we have to have one voice, one set of ears, one set of records. And it's coming through our Letitia Gottwald here. And there's one phone number on all the posters that you see around, et cetera. It's to communicate through her. She is in constant communication. I mean, we're talking weekly back and forth, we're always communicating. She's with the board of directors and, and contacting us and then gathering the cases and screening the cases, pre-screening so that when the surgeons and the nurses and everybody arrives, the anesthesiologist, we already have appointments set up. It's no longer the giant masses down the street that are coveting each other, <laughs> not coveting, <laughs> coveting. And so we have, been able to keep our clinics open where others have failed by, by changing our mechanism and by making this a very individualized uh, mission clinic and, and yet um, producing it in, in a very effective and, and uh, efficacious fashion. So uh, if, if I could, I don't have her number, but I can just say that when everybody um, uh, is thinking that they found somebody and they're excited and they want to contact Rotary, Rotary knows her number. Uh, Rotary Los Cabos, but also there'll be uh, the posters and they'll be out there and on our website, I'm going to make sure that she has a button on there that takes care of it as well. We, we've only started that this year. It began February of this year and now August. And so um, you'll be, you'll be seeing that as your contact for communications in all of Mexico. We're going to, she's already in charge of Tecate, Cabo, and we do get children from Sinaloa for Cabo, of course, by the ferry. And we get them up in um, uh, uh, in Sonora, coming over to Tecate. So we're pretty much taking care of this strip, <laughs> and I'm happy about it. And then the Ishku heel over in Yucatan with the Mayan smiles. So thank you again, and we love Mexico. And we love you, Dr. Moses. And the number to contact is 624-211-8833. We're going to post it on Cabo Mill News. Facebook page, and uh, and we will make sure that everybody knows how to get a hold of Leticia. Excellent. Absolutely. And and Doctor, you're definitely doing God's work. Yeah, we really appreciate what you're doing. As as a, a mentor of mine, Tom Walsh used to say, "There's two most important days in your life: is when you're born, and when you know why you're born." And I, I really feel like you're doing that work of of, of why you were born. Just thank you so much for, for inspiring all of us. And we're, we're, we're just excited to have you in your show. Hopefully we'll have you back soon. We look forward to that. And for all of you out there, thanks for joining us this week on, on community. What is it? What are we called? Uh, community community, update. community update. See, I'm all, I'm all flustered because I'm blown away by what, by what Dr. Moses was telling us. <laughs> be back. Tell them, but it happens. <laughs> I know. Be back next week. We'll be here on Sunday at 6 p.m. And always follow us on Facebook Live at Cabo Mill News. Catch you later. Catch you next time.